Hi, everybody. I am Kevin Ioli. I appreciate you joining me. I got another great interview today. A guy that's been busy uh, with the big guys, with the small guys. He's doing a little bit of everything. Uh, my friend uh, Tom Loffer. How are you, Tom? That's uh, great, Kevin. I'll tell you, after doing so many heavyweight championship fights with the Klitschko brothers, now uh, the Superfly series has really taken off. Uh, the Superfly 1 was a tremendous success last September. And uh, Superfly 2 now coming up this Saturday at the Forum on HBO. Um, we, we're opening up the upper bowl now at the Forum, which means we're going to have a tremendous crowd. We're, we're going to release those tickets today because of the fan response. Um, so many great champions in town, and uh, the fans have really responded to the matchups on the show. You know, I, I had said, Tom, uh, going back a long time, I was calling when Chocolatito had never been on Premium Cable. I said, hey, let's get Chocolatito on. This guy's a great fighter, one of the best fighters in the world. And, right. You know, the Premium Cable Networks were the ones that were doing most of the boxing then. And they, for some reason, they did not really – it's kind of like they didn't adopt women's boxing and they didn't adopt uh, the, the lighter weight classes. Uh, did, how did you convince them to take a chance? So let's start with Chocolatito, even though he's not on this card. But he was kind of the guy that got this all rolling. How did you get HBO to take a shot on Chocolatito? You know, it wasn't that hard uh, of a sell. It was actually, um, you know, we were looking at, at a great uh, pairing for Triple G um, when he was fighting on HBO, when he was fighting at pay-per-view, and uh, Chocolatito just seemed like the natural fit. He was considered the, the number one pound-for-pound -pound fighter at the time. Um, he had a strong Hispanic following, and, uh, you know, with his performances in the ring ever since the, his HBO debut was at the Forum, um, when he knocked out, uh, I think it was Edgar Sosa uh, in the second round, put on a tremendous uh, display. And then ever since then, the fans just really gravitated towards him. And, uh, 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 you know, same thing with Triple G. Ever since he made his HBO debut, the fans wanted to keep seeing him. It was the same thing with Chocotito. Since he, he had uh, that, that great knockout on HBO, then it just made sense to keep putting him back on. And there were so many great matchups for him, you know, Arroyo, Quadras, uh, Rungvisai, you know, it just made sense uh, with the quality of the matchups. And the great thing, Kevin, also with the Superfly show is with the light divisions, the flyweight divisions, super flyweight divisions, uh, the guys are willing to fight each other. The best guys are willing to fight each other. Now that Inouye moved up, Rungvisai and Estrada are clearly the two best uh, fighters in the super flyweight division, and they're willing to fight each other. You don't see that at heavyweight. You don't see that at welterweight. And, and I think that's what the fans are responding to, that, you know, we brought in champions from all over the world, and now the fans get to see them all together on one show on HBO and uh, at, at the forum. Well, let, let's, uh, let me explore that question with you just one second then. You know, you sure. started out in the boxing business as a manager. Uh, uh, a lot of people know you managed welterweight contender Obakar. Uh, right. So you were on that side of it. You were the advising fighter of whether this is a good fight to take or not. Right. Why is that? Because boxing is the one sport, if you go out there and you look, where the you have difficulty getting the best to fight the best. You don't have that in college football, college basketball, of course, in the NBA, NHL, NFL, uh, they all play. Why is it in boxing it is so freaking hard to get the best to fight the best <laughs> regularly? I tell you, Kevin, uh, we tried with the Triple G uh, since his HBO debut in September 2012 to get the other champions in the ring with them. In fact, HBO actually came up with the concept of, wow, it was a great splash. Here's this undefeated WBA champion from Kazakhstan, let's do a middleweight tournament. And as soon as, uh, uh, so everyone was agreeing to this tournament, and as, super, as soon as they uh, put Triple G's name in there, everyone jumped off. I remember it was Daniel Giel, it was Sergio Martinez, I think they were talking about Peter Cullen at the time. It was, uh, uh, I don't remember the exact names, but it was, uh, they, they had three or four guys, and then uh, as soon as they suggested Triple G's name, then, then it fell apart. So, uh, you know, Triple G was the guy that he's really, he was really, willing to go anywhere, fight anyone, and at a reasonable price, and we still couldn't unify the title. So I think it's just a statement on this, uh, you know, the state of boxing today. I don't know. You know, Floyd has done so many great things uh, for the for the sport in terms of financial records, um, financial records that uh, he's broken with pay-per-view sales, ticket sales, but I think that unblemished, undefeated record, a lot of fighters uh, look at what he's accomplished, and they're like, well, let me take an easier fight. Right. Uh, before a risky fight, whereas, uh, you know, years ago, if you had one, two, three, five or more losses, it wasn't a big deal because the best would fight the best. And, and uh, it's unfortunate that you have that type of mentality. And I, and I think with the with the flyweight divisions and the super flyweight divisions, 
they know they have to fight. If it, it's their opportunity to shine on HBO. They have to put on a great performance uh, in order to get back. And, uh, and they're willing to fight each other. Quadras is again. Now he's fighting Arroyo. And, and uh, Sisriket hasn't had an easy run. He had to fight Chocolatito twice. Now he's fighting Estrada. Yeah. You know? and, uh, but it, it just uh, it goes to show you the quality uh, and the depth of, uh, of uh, you know, the, 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 the class at that uh, well, let, let's go over the card on Saturday uh, so people sure. know. And, 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 and I want to pay special attention to the main I got the uh, HBO poster right uh, behind me there. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll read my own notes. Okay. I, get cheat <laughs> I got some right. of the names. In the main event, uh, uh, Sri Sor Ring Vasai, uh, who is yeah. 44, 4 and 1 with 40 KOs, right. uh, fights uh, Juan Francisco Estrada, who was 36 and 2 with 25. I, I wrote down, I just looked up Estrada's record, and I, a couple of years ago I had him as a finalist for Fight of the Year at Yahoo when he fought uh, Tyson Marquez. Uh, okay. It was an incre incredible event. Um, mm -hmm. But some of the guys he's fought, Quadras, Tyson Marquez, Brian Valoria, Giovanni Segura, uh, yeah. now he's fighting Rome Vasai. I mean, you're talking about a guy, those were all elite fighters he fought, and some Absolutely. of those were Fight of the Year type fights that he was in. Uh, and now he's going up against Rome Vasai, who yeah. his fight with Chocolatito, he could have had knockout of the year, fight of the year. He could have yeah. been fighter of the year. I mean, he, he really had a big year. Uh, Estrada is something special. That is my kind of fighter. Oh, absolutely. And that's really, I mean, there's so many great matchups on the show, but that's the fight. You know, the main event is the fight that the fans are really looking forward to. I mean, we got so many great matchups. I could, I could see out of those four championship caliber fights, you could see two or three candidates for fight of the year. But, you know, if you can believe it, Kevin, remember when uh, Estrada fought Chocotito? That was the co-feature to Brian Valoria at the uh, L.A. Sports Arena yes. in Los Angeles. So uh, how things have changed. Uh, Brian Valoria is, is, a, is a great fan favorite here in the L.A. area. But um, like you said, uh, Estrada has had some great matchups. The fact that he beat Quadras in, in, in his last fight, he definitely earned uh, the mandatory challenger status. And, uh, and it's a tremendous matchup. I think uh, Estrada... Is more of a technical fighter, uh, and Rungvasai just comes forward. He's a big puncher. The way uh, he knocked out uh, Chocotito in the last fight, he's a southpaw. So it'll be an interesting matchup of uh, of styles in that main event. Yeah, I want to ask you about Rungvasai because you know he, a lot of the Thai fighters come out and you know they fight exclusively in Thailand and then they come here and we don't know a lot about them. They you know they don't travel a lot and we you know they have gaudy records, but some you know some guys can fight. And some like uh, uh, Kiram, who fought on HBO uh, against Lucas Matisse, it turns out, you know, maybe he can't really fight that much. So when right. Rungvisai fought uh, Chocolatito on the Triple G Danny Jacobs yeah. undercard, I don't think a lot of people thought he was going to give uh, Chocolatito a heck of a lot of A lot coverage. of people didn't know him. You're uh, right. A lot of trouble. Yeah. You know, did, did you have any sense going into that fight that this could be a tough fight for Chocolatito? You know, I knew uh, just by seeing the size of uh, Sister Cat, I also didn't know that much about him. Uh, uh, I'm, you know, even though we've done a lot of the uh, flyweight shows, uh, I don't have that depth of, of you know, between uh, some of the, uh, some of the lower tier guys. And, uh, and I got to say, Sisriket really rose to the occasion. You could say that was under the, uh, some of the brightest lights in the sport of boxing, Madison Square Garden on HBO pay-per-view as the co-feature to Triple G and Danny Jacobs. And he you know, dumped him in the first round. Some people would freeze under those, uh, under those conditions. And you're right. I think he shocked everyone. Uh, with that knockout, with a knockdown in the first round, Chocolatito, you have to say, you got to give him a lot of credit. Chocolatito came back. A lot of people thought that he, that Chocolatito should have edged the decision with the way he, he came back strong in the later rounds. But uh, with the rematch, that's why the WBC ordered the rematch. And with the rematch, Rungvasai, no you know, that adage about, you know, become a world champion that, you know, makes the, the, the fighter that much better, you know, with his training conditions, you know, he was able to improve. With, uh, with that win and becoming world champion. And I think just his confidence level beating the number one guy at that time, I think it just, uh, you saw he was extremely confident in the rematch. And uh, with his punching power, I mean, he's going to be hard to beat at that uh, super flyweight division. And, and the co-main event is an IBF flyweight fight, uh, title fight. And I think it's really interesting about Donnie Nietes here. Uh, Nietes is 40 wins, one loss, and four draws, but 22 chaos. But... He's been unbeaten since 2004. 
So basically, 14 years <laughs> yeah, this yeah. has gone undefeated. I was fighting one Carlos Rovecos, 39 and three with 19 KOs. Then we mentioned uh, Brian Valoria. Uh, Brian, a member of the 2000 Olympic team. And I think the most amazing thing, the fact that in 2018, Brian Valoria is fighting for a world title in the right. same weight class 18 <laughs> years later. How yeah, he's one of those guys that didn't make weight. <laughs> He didn't gain. Uh, he didn't gain weight. Uh, he stayed at that uh, that level, and uh, he's the sole survivor of uh, the 2000 uh, Olympic class, like you said. And uh, you know, being uh, at that championship level for for so long, this if if he can win, it's a vacant WBA flyweight title. If he can beat Delakian, now he's fighting an undefeated Ukrainian guy that's very hungry. I've seen Delakian. He was at the open workout. Here and I know a few things about Ukrainian fighters, yeah, you know, with Usyk and the Klitschko brothers, and they have a tremendous amateur program there. And and when you have an undefeated guy coming out of the Ukrainian system, uh, you can't underestimate him. If if Brian wins, it'll be his fifth world championship fight or title, if you can believe that. A five-time world champion, and uh, you know that's going to be a great matchup. And that's not even. I mean, this card is so deep, Kevin. That's not even on the HBO triple header. We have uh, actually the co-features, Quadras versus Arroyo, where you have that classic Mexico versus versus Puerto Rico uh, matchup. And Quadras is a fan favorite. He sells a lot of tickets here in the L.A. area to the Hispanic fight fans. And and uh, he's just a very personable, marketable guy that has – he's training with Abel Sanchez now in Big Bear. And I think we'll see – this will be the easiest that he's ever made the weight. He was only one pound over yesterday. And uh, I think we'll see a rejuvenated Carlos Quadras. In, uh, I, I interviewed Abel a couple of weeks ago, and he, he talked about Quadras. said he wasn't so interested in him at first, but yeah. after he got him in there, he was receptive to what Abel wanted to do. And a Abel was uh, predicting big things. Uh, but McWilliams Arroyo is, uh, you know, is kind of a, a tough guy for him to take on in his first fight. Uh, I, I think, you know, under Abel, you know, it's not, it's not like he gave him a chance to get in there and say, no, okay, no, we're, we're going to get used to the new trainer and then we'll fight somebody. But you put him in with a guy that can, I, I think, cause him a lot of trouble. Yeah. I mean, uh, McWilliams went the distance with uh, Chocotito and uh, he's a big puncher. He also has a lot of knockouts and he was on the Puerto Rican Olympic team. So he has a very solid amateur background and uh, it, it'll be, you know, th that's one of those fights that, uh, you know, because of the pride of Mexico, the pride of Puerto Rico, it's almost like they elevate their their game when they when they fight each other. They have so much at stake, and their national pride is at stake. So that's going to be, I think, that's going to be a fun fight, uh, also. Uh, you know how the how the styles mesh and, and Abel, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's the water or the air, the thin air up in Big Bear, but uh, he always seems to bring out a lot more power in the fighters that he trains. And I, so I think we'll see a much more aggressive uh, Carlos Quadras on Saturday night. Now, let, uh, in the remaining time that we have, Tom, let, I just want I talked to you earlier about uh, the the Triple G Canelo fight. Right. Um, but let, let you know, I, I can never talk to you about the judging too much, right? So <laughs> I, I had Golovkin one fifteen, one thirteen, and I scored the seventh round in favor of Gennady Golovkin. Um, I think most people, I think most people <laughs> scored it that way. And if I'm not mistaken, Adelaide Bird scored the seventh round. That's right. That was one of the two Golovkin. rounds that she gave to uh, Gennady, so he must have done something right in that. Uh, in that in that round, and yet Don Trella, who really hasn't come under a lot of criticism for his score, he had it one fourteen, one fourteen, but he gave the seventh round to uh, Canelo. Right. Inexplicable. Did you? You know, I know you know you're not really supposed to interact with the judges, but did you ever have a chance to bump into him along the way and say, Don, what happened in that round? Look, both uh, Adelaide Bird and Don Trella had scored uh, a number of fights uh, in the past: uh, Klitschko fights, Triple G fights. You know, fights that we'd been involved in, Chocotito fights. So uh, there was nothing on either side that uh, stood out to say, well, we, you know, we can't uh, accept them as, as one of the judges, you know, from a purely boxing standpoint. But uh, I don't know. It, it just seems really odd, uh, the judging uh, that night. Uh, Dave Moretti had it exactly like you did, uh, seven rounds to five. I, you know, I had it like Harold Letterman had it, eight rounds to four. Uh, but... You know, I think eight to four, seven five was was the right score, um, especially with the seventh round going to Triple G, like you said. So um, we can't really cry over spilled milk. It definitely had a big effect on uh, Gennady's career. And unfortunately, instead of having you know uh, a, an unblemished record, he, he has a draw, a perfect record. Right? He's still undefeated. Uh, he's still the world champion, uh, unified world champion. Uh, but he does have a draw on his record. And, uh, you know, that's something that uh, he wants to avenge now. I think now you'll see even a, a, a hungry, even though 
yeah, would feel, yeah, yeah. and Abel also feels he won, won eight rounds of four. We'll see an even hungrier Triple G come out there to make a bigger statement. And Canelo says that you know he wants to go for a knockout. So I think it'll be a, a interesting to see how they make their adjustments. Well, you know, I want to say this, and I want to get your reaction to it. Um, it was a good fight. But I think everybody that was writing about it, especially because Mayweather yeah. McGregor came before, and so right. everybody in the media is trying to contrast. Okay, don't expect Mayweather McGregor to be this great of a fight, but right. here's the real fight. And while I thought it was a good fight, maybe even a very good fight, it did not. It was not the epic all-time classic fight. I don't know if you would agree with that. That I think I thought it would be, and a lot of people thought it would be. And Gennady maybe it wasn't even, you know, Canelo moved more than I thought, but Gennady wasn't, didn't have that trademark aggressiveness. Like when he went after Matt Macklin and when he went after Curtis Stevens, like he was mean and angry and you got the sense sitting at ringside, you could just feel that in him. And I did not sense that in the Canelo fight. Was that just a matter of, you know, him going up to the highest level and him, you know, maybe having to pace himself differently? Or do you have any idea why we didn't see the kind of beast Gennady that we sometimes think we would see? Yeah, I I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the styles, the way uh, the way it matched up. Uh, nobody expected Canelo to be as defensive as he was. You know, he said he's he's the true Mexican with the real Mexican style, and then he was the one that really came out uh, fighting defensively. That uh, you know, <laughs> Abel has a great quote that says uh, Canelo went in uh, as a Mexican and came out as Floyd. <laughs> 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 <That's a fight. laughs> so Mr. Abel Sanchez with the one liners. <laughs> so. Uh, you know that that's naturally going to play and uh, in effect. I mean, Gennady does, uh, in my opinion, cut off the ring. Uh, one of the best fighters I've ever seen. Um, you know, he wasn't able to do it as effectively as we'd like to have seen him done uh, to have done last September. I think a lot of it had to do with uh, look. You got to give Canelo credit. He he fought against the ropes. He was had a lot of upper body movement, and uh, you know he was very elusive. Um, Gennady outlanded him ten out of the twelve rounds. Uh, primarily was landing the jab, but, um, you know, Gennady's jab is just as hard as uh, most people's power punches. So um, to get, you know, to answer your question, I think a lot of it had to do with uh, the way Canelo fought. But at the same time, uh, I think in the rematch, now that uh, Abel and Gennady, you know, might be better prepared for that movement from Canelo, I think you'll see them working on uh, cutting off the ring. It's one thing, you know, to trap someone in the corner, but when Canelo's on the ropes and then slips, right. slips out of the ropes... You know that that's uh, somewhat, especially with that upper body movement that he showed. It's uh, somewhat hard to to uh, to navigate. And um, you know, I think uh, I think the it, it, I agree with you. We didn't see the all out fireworks that uh, a lot of people thought in the first fight, even though it was an entertaining and exciting fight. Um, it, it was really a high level boxing IQ that we saw. But I think in the rematch, we'll see a little bit more of a. Uh, knockdown, uh, drag out fight uh, between both guys. Just a couple more questions. Uh, the first fight did 1.3 million on pay per view. I know Golden Boy at one point disputed that and said they were going to put out a statement that it was higher, and they never did. Um, I was pretty confident that it was 1.3 million, um, but that came a couple weeks after a fight that sold over 4 million on pay per view. A, how much do you think Mayweather McGregor hurt the pay per view sales of uh, of Canelo Triple G? And B, what do you think is reasonable to do this time, uh, given people have seen them one time already? It, it was actually over one. Uh, it was over one three. Um, we did have a, a significant amount of uh, online pay per view buys. So uh, I think the number wound up closer to just under one five. But either way, I mean, I, to your point is it was Mayweather McGregor significantly. I mean, you know, it, it, uh, they moved the needle uh, tremendously. So we have to give them a lot of credit for uh, their promotion. Um, you know, they had a, a little different style as far as how they went about promoting it. They, they definitely had a big uh, UFC uh, fan base that I, I think supported McGregor. Uh, in the flight, in, in the fight, and, and Floyd, you know, has become, you know, the pay-per-view king as far as you know his numbers with Pacquiao and and, uh, and McGregor. I think those are numbers that are going to be hard to beat at, uh, you know, at any point. At the same time, when you have two uh, non-American fighters, this was the highest-grossing uh, pay-per-view fight since I believe uh, Pacquiao uh, Marquez, um, you know, or the the first one to break a million buys uh, since Pacquiao Marquez. So you got to give both guys a lot of credit uh, for really uh, establishing, establishing themselves in the U.S. market as uh, two of the most marketable guys. We set the, the record for the third highest boxing gate in, in boxing history 
uh, with two non-American fighters in, in Las Vegas. So, so um, you know, there's a lot of things to be proud of in, in the promotion, and I think the fans will respond uh, to the rematch now that, you know, both guys' names really are uh, on a higher level. And I think that the interesting thing about this matchup, Kevin, that, you know, when we did the negotiations, it's one of those things where Canelo needs Triple G and Triple G needs Canelo to do the, these type of mega numbers. Uh, and uh, they both have a very solid uh, fan base. Gennady has people flying in internationally for his fights. Canelo has a lot of people coming up from Mexico, and they, they really complement each other. Uh, very well as far as their fan bases and, and that's why I think we'll see an even more successful uh, promotion uh, on Cinco de Mayo. Interesting that Canelo is training in Colorado Springs this time so maybe he figures he needs some edge uh, given elevation given how how the fight went the last time. But just to wrap up, last thing, um, I get a lot of people since I've been doing these interviews I'm getting a lot of people talking to me about hey, they want to see me interview this person, that person I get everybody asking me when am I going to get Gennady Golovkin I, <laughs> I am getting Gennady Golovkin, he's coming on yeah. you hold the keys to Gennady Golovkin, yeah. please tell the people when is Gennady Golovkin coming on? We have uh, uh, the media week set uh, for next week where we're going to uh, announce the fight officially in Los Angeles on, on Tuesday at LA Live. And so we're definitely going to work in uh, a sit-down interview with you and uh, Triple G uh, one of those days, either Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But uh, you can definitely, we'll, we'll have it uh, set up uh, plenty of time ahead of time so you can... Uh, you can announce it, and and we'll uh, we'll bring Triple G onto your uh, onto your video cast. We'll so if, you, if you ended up watching this whole interview between me no. and Tom, you got to the end. You got the most important news. That <laughs> yep, Triple that's G. It. You saved the best news for last. <laughs> exactly, Tom. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Always fun talking to you. Good luck with the show on Saturday. Thanks, Kevin. We appreciate that. We have to get Gennady to come to one of those uh, Golden Knight hockey games uh, with you sometime. Listen, I'll tell my wife to not go, and we'll bring Gennady. <laughs> that's a deal. <laughs> All, All right, right Kevin. see ya. All right.